Hey, welcome back to Quick Hits in Lab Medicine. I'm Rob Fitzgerald, and we're going to spend about the next 15 minutes talking about uh, hormones that regulate electrolyte balance, and we're going to talk about anion gaps and osmolal gaps and, and how we use these clinically. Um, so the objectives are to talk about uh, the two hormones. That would be ADH, or vasopressin, and uh, aldosterone, uh, that regulate electrolyte and acid-base balance. Um, we're going to talk about how to calculate anion gaps, how to calculate osmolality, and how to calculate osmolal gaps. Um, so before we do that, I think it's worth talking about the differences between plasma and serum just really quickly. Um, plasma needs an anticoagulant, and so the concern there is if you're doing electrolytes, what anticoagulant you use. So if you use something like um, sodium EDTA, obviously that's not going to work very well for measuring electrolytes. But you can use uh, things like lithium heparin or ammonium heparin and still measure electrolytes. Um, the reason we like to use plasma in the laboratory is that we don't have to wait for samples to clot before we spin them down. Um, Serum is essentially just uh, clotted plasma, um, and in that clotting process, you lyse thrombocytes, and intracellular contents of potassium is much higher than extracellular. And so when you, when you lyse thrombocytes, you leach out potassium, and so in serum, your potassium is typically you know, 0.2 milliequivalents uh, higher than it is in, in plasma. So there, there is a little bit of a difference there. Um, the hormones that are responsible for regulating would be ADH, um, antidiuretic hormone. I like to think of it as vasopressin. ADH, you, it's really sort of a negative, what is it not doing? Whereas vasopressin, if you think of it as vasopressin, it's actually increasing the pressure um, by reabsorbing water. And so that's really what ADH does, is reabsorbs water in the collecting ducts and uh, ascending loop. It's produced in the hypothalamus and stored in the pituitary. It reabsorbs water. Um, it is regulated centrally by both baro and osmo receptors. And so if you have uh, low blood pressure, you're going to get ADH secreted. Um, <clears throat> same thing with osmolality. It's going to help regulate your osmolality. Um, the two diseases that we talk about would be uh, diabetes insipidus. And so that's a case where either you don't have receptors for ADH or you're not producing. So that would be either you know, central uh, diabetes insipidus. Is, it would be lack of production of ADH. Um, whereas uh, if it's in the periphery, then that would be more of a renal response. Um, the, other, the other one is aldosterone. And um, aldosterone is really important for a variety of things. And it shows up in a lot of different disease states. And so you really need to remember that uh, aldosterone really does four things. It, uh, it reabsorbs sodium and bicarb, and it excretes potassium and hydrogen ions. So if you remember those four things, you can figure out what happens in Kahn syndrome. You can figure out what happens in Cushing's disease. You can figure out what happens in um, <clears throat> primary aldosteronism, you can, so really understanding those four things, you can interpret a lot of lab values. Reclaim sodium and bicarb, excretes potassium and hydrogen ions. And so if you have too much aldosterone, you get a metabolic alkalosis with hypokalemia. And so that all follows by, you know, just memorizing those four things that aldosterone does. It is part of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. It is primarily um, renally regulated. So if you have decreased GFR, um, you secrete renin, which goes through the angiotensin-aldosterone and uh, uh, finally acts to do the four things that aldosterone does. So diseases associated with aldosterone would be Addison's, and that's typically an autoimmune destruction of the adrenal cortex. So you lose both aldosterone and cortisol. Um, Kahn syndrome is primary hyperaldosteronism. So that would be a tumor that's secreting too much aldosterone. And your acid base is going to change um, based on aldosterone. And we think of aldosterone as being a mineralicoid, and, and that's correct, but it also has weak glucocorticoid effects.
Similarly, cortisol is a glucocorticoid, but it has weak mineralocoid effects. And so you do start to see some of the effects of aldosterone-like behavior in hypercortisolism. And in a similar manner, in hyperaldosterone, you see hyperglycemia due to the glucocorticoid effect at high concentrations. So switching gears and talking about anion gaps. Um, anion gaps really tell us um, something for free, and we like that. Basically, we're measuring electrolytes, sodium and potassium, bicarb and chloride, and we're seeing if, by looking at the anion gap, we're seeing if there's something else there that's irregular. Um, that we haven't measured, but that we should be aware of. And that's really what an anion gap tells us. An anion gap arises from the fact that when we measure cations, the two cations we measure for electrolytes would be, let me get my pointer here, would be sodium, that's the primary cation, and potassium. Um, and when we measure anions, we measure chloride as our most abundant anion and bicarb. And what you'll see is, is that we measure more cations than we do anions. And so if we do, if we subtract anions from cations, that's essentially an anion gap, um, we're picking up what's happening in this block. And so we're not measuring these directly, but indirectly we're inferring something that's happening to either inorganic acids or organic acids or proteins based on the anion gap. And essentially what happens is that anytime you increase these, you decrease chloride and bicarb, and so you increase the gap. And so an, an increased anion gap is really most sensitive to an increase of one of these, uh, one of these blocks. Um, so a normal chloride is about 103, a normal bicarb is maybe 27, and so um, when we add up sodium and potassium and we subtract out chloride and bicarb, they don't completely cancel each other out. In reality, we have the same amount of cations as we do anions, um, but it's simply that we're not measuring all of the, uh, all of the constituents um, that contribute to both anions and cations, and that's why we have a, uh, a gap. So we have, we've got more unmeasured anions than we do unmeasured cations, and that causes the gap. So simply, the, um, what we're doing is cations minus anions, and typically uh, a normal range for an anion gap is 10 to 20. So somewhere around 16 is the average. And if we use those examples, and we come out with uh, uh, an anion gap of 16, um, some people leave out the potassium, and, and that works generally fine. It just shifts the reference range by four. So it would be about four units lower. Um, so causes of increased anion gap, um, really, again, this is in our gamble gram. These are either inorganic acids, organic acids, or proteins, and in particular, that protein is albumin that we're talking about. Albumin is negatively charged, so it's an anion. So ketoacidosis basically is our, this is diabetic ketoacidosis where you form keto acids. These are organic acids. They are going to expand, so we're going to shrink out both our bicarbonate and our chloride. Um, renal failure, you can't excrete both organic and organic acids, so your, your acid block goes up and your unmeasured anions um, goes down. Your lactic acidosis is another organic acid. Um, these drugs are, are all are negatively charged, and so they're going to contribute to our anions. They're not going to be measured, and we're going to get an increase in our gap. Poisonings. Aspirin, methanol, ethylene glycol, peraldehyde, all of these uh, drugs or poisons, um, depending on the dose, uh, are metabolized to carboxylic acids. So they're going to be an organic acid. They're going to increase that organic acid uh, block and decrease our measured anions. And so our, our anion gap is going to go up. So causes of decreased gaps, these would be less common than an increased anion gap. Um, hypoalbuminemia. And so what's happening there is, is that in our anion block, our protein, um, in particular that protein is albumin, is getting smaller. And so both our chloride and our bicarb would have to increase to counteract the loss of, of albumin. And so our unmeasured anions is going to go down and our gap also goes down. Um, 
Hema dilution, essentially, if you dilute everything, you're also diluting the gap, so the, the gap goes down. Paraproteins, um, paraproteins are M proteins, they're monoclonal proteins. We typically think of those in relationship to multiple myeloma. Um, they are positively charged proteins. So unlike albumin, which is negatively charged, paraproteins are typically positively charged. So if they're positively charged, they're going to increase our unmeasured cations, and that's going to decrease our measured cations, which is going to decrease our gap. So if you're confused about that, spend a little time with a gambogram and uh, just realize that sort of the top and bottom of that gambogram are fixed. And when we have changes in our anions that are unmeasured, that's going to what is going to affect our gap primarily. So talking about serum osmolality, um, osmolality is number of particles per kilogram. And so it's a, it's a colligative property. Um, <clears throat> And it's most sensitive to low molecular weight compounds because higher molecular weight compounds, you simply have less number of particles. So we don't include albumin in this calculation for a couple of reasons. One is that it's a big protein, and when you divide its, um, its concentration by its, uh, its uh, molecular formula, the number of particles there is relatively low compared to something like sodium. It's also negatively charged, and sodium is going to be sort of accounting for your albumin. So um, we calculate osmolality based on common labs that we measure. And so this is the equation that many people use. There, there are several different calculations for osmolality. Um, two times sodium. And so what we need to remember is that the units for sodium are either millimoles per liter or milliequivalents per liter. And so essentially, both millimoles and milliequivalents are particles, right? That's, that's, a, that's number of particles per liter, and that's what we're concerned about in osmolality. So sodium is positively charged, so it carries a negative anion with it. And so sodium really makes this equation very simple. We don't have to measure all of the bicarbs and albumins and all the rest of the, of the anions. We just simply say, OK, every sodium has to have a counter anion. We're just going to multiply sodium by 2, and that's going to account for most of our charged species. Um, glucose is reported not in milliequivalents, but in milligrams per deciliter. And the, uh, the molecular weight of glucose is 180. And so when we switch from liters to deciliters, that changes the decimal place by 10. So essentially what we're doing is, is we're converting a concentration here into number of particles of glucose. So 180, we move the decimal place by 1 to make it 18. We divide glucose in milligrams per deciliter by 18 to figure out how much this uncharged species is contributing to osmolality. Similar for urea nitrogen. Nitrogen weighs 14 is its atomic mass. Its molecular formula is N2, and so it is 28. We move the decimal place by one, and we're going to be able to figure out what is the, what is the contribution of urea to osmolality. Um, we typically um, calculate an osmolality, and in some cases, we'll also measure it. And if we do that, we can calculate an osmolal gap. Um, Things that cause uh, hyperosmolality, um, dehydration. If you're dehydrated, your sodium is going to be elevated, so are all the rest of your uh, cations and anions, and so that's going to cause uh, hyperosmolality. Hyperglycemia, same thing. Glucose is part of our formula. It makes sense. If that's high, you're going to have hyperosmolality. Diabetes insipidus is essentially dehydration. You have um, your excreting a lot of volume of fluid, and so your, your electrolytes are concentrated. Uremia, same thing. Urea is part of our formula. If you have lots of urea in circulation, you're going to be hyperosmolar. Uh, ethanol is not in our calculation formula, but clearly does contribute and is a common, probably the most common cause of hyperosmolality uh, in the emergency department. Um, improper specimen collection. So if they collected plasma using sodium EDTA, that sodium is going to be artificially high, and that's going to cause your osmolality to be um, incorrectly uh, calculated. Hypoosmolality, overhydration, SIADH, that's when you're secreting ADH when you shouldn't. That's essentially uh, 
overhydration. Um, compulsive water drinking um, would also be overhydration. So in that case, you're essentially just diluting out all of your osmols so you become hypoosmolal. The osmolal gap is the difference between measured and calculated osmolality. So we can measure it by freezing point depression. It's a lab test you order. Um, we also calculate it based on sodium, glucose, and urea, and we see what the difference there is. And, and what that's telling us is there's something else there that we didn't measure. And so if you have an elevated osmolal gap, you are most sensitive to low molecular weight things like uh, volatile alcohols. And we will go over that in a second. So a high osmolal gap suggests the presence of some other compound, ethanol being the most common one. Um, and you would figure that out by also measuring a serum ethanol and seeing, did that explain the gap? If it didn't, then they might have some other low molecular weight substance on board as well. Um, so osmolal gaps, uh, this is my acronym for remembering osmolal gaps, not anion gaps, but osmolal gaps. And so I remembered as me, die. It's kind of sadistic, but um, uh, me, methanol, and ethylene glycol, they're low molecular weight uh, alcohols. They aren't going to be accounted for by the sodium, and so they're going to contribute to the osmolality. Diuretics, here we're talking about osmotically active diuretics, mannitol, sorbitol, something like that. Um, isopropanol and ethanol. Um, we put a star by methanol and ethylene glycol because these also cause an anion gap when they get metabolized. They get metabolized to carboxylic acids and also contribute to an anion gap. So the combination of an elevated anion gap with an osmolal gap strongly points to methanol, ethylene glycol. Um, and with that, uh, I appreciate you paying attention to uh, anion gaps, osmolal gaps. Anion gaps are very common. You need to know how to use those. Osmolal gaps you'll also be exposed to, so uh, worth knowing. So thanks for tuning in.